Thanks, guys. You can be seated. Thanks for coming to worship with us today. Easter Sunday, what a great day to worship God. It's, we always celebrate the resurrection, but I, there, I think there's something about this day that we just set aside and uh, glad to proclaim it. Glad you're here today. Thanks for coming so much. If you are uh, any kind of a sports addict of any kind or just even sports aware, uh, you know that right now uh, March Madness is on. Who knows what March Madness is? Who doesn't know? Who doesn't care? Yeah. Who never raises their hand in church? Ah, thanks. <laughs> Got you to break through somehow. March Madness is uh, when... Uh, uh, the best college teams come together and play each other and whittle it down to two of the best teams in the nation, and they play. There's actually a bracket that people try to estimate who might uh, be the winners, and uh, no one's ever made it past the Sweet 16, but um, it's interesting. Now, it's, this is probably the time of year where I might start watching a little bit of basketball. I'm, I'm not a huge basketball fan, um, but I thought it was interesting to think about this idea that uh, Michael Jordan, who is considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest basketball players ever to play, played for UNC. Um, I think UNC lost this week. <laughs> I knew that would, yeah, booze, yays, yeah, I know. Can't please everybody, that, now you see why. And... Uh, but uh, Michael Jordan really considered one of the greatest basketball players ever, um, and uh, his shooting percentage was less than half of the shots that he shot actually went in the basket. Uh, Steph Curry is a guy that a lot of people like and watch some, and uh, he has set the record, NBA record, for uh, three-point shots, and he's, he's just a lot of fun to watch him play, but only 42% of his three-point shots go in, and he's the best. Uh, that's ever played in the NBA. And um, then there's a young lady that has kind of caught the attention of a lot of uh, sports right now. I mean, literally selling out stadiums, arenas where she's playing. Caitlin Clark is her name. Uh, and uh, she's a lot of fun to watch playing along with her team. And she shoots like 45% of her shots. And what I, what I think is interesting about all these guys who are absolutely the best at what they do is that less than half the shots they attempt are made. So what that means in one sense is rebounds are important. Who gets the ball on all those shots that are missed, um, whether the offense gets it or the defense get it, and who ends up with the ball typically the most on the rebound uh, is the team that would end up winning. How you handle the rebounds in life is determining whether you're going to win the game or not. And when I think about Easter, I think Easter is the great rebound. Jesus <laughs> went to the cross. It was not a loss for Jesus to go to the cross. For people who didn't understand what was happening, uh, it was a loss, but really the tragedy of the cross and people are trying to figure out what is going on here. And uh, Jesus, three days later, uh, overcomes death, hell, the grave. It's the victory of the resurrection. And, and, and I'm into it. And so today I want to talk about the idea for just a few moments about the great rebound, the great rebound. And I want to look at a story that I really like a lot. Uh, this is a story that takes place right after Jesus is resurrected. But at first, the guys don't really understand what's going on. And so uh, let me read you a few verses and share a couple of ideas today. Luke 24, verse 13. Behold, on that very day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem, a seven-mile seven walk. Uh, they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place, and while they were talking, 
and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. The, the first thing I, I want to point out today is your rebound is closer than you think. Yeah. God, God is actually closer to you than you think. Uh, here are, these guys are walking, talking, trying to figure out what's going on in life and where they, things they had put their hope in. And the resurrected Jesus is literally walking alongside of them, but they can't see it yet. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him at all. And I think a part of it is the idea that a lot of the disciples had an idea in their head. They were looking for Jesus to be a political Messiah, that he was going to return glory to Israel as a political Messiah. And maybe they were missing him because they had false expectations about who Jesus was. I'm not an anti-government person, but I'm just going to tell you, God is not going to do what he wants to do through government. He's going to do it through his people. And, and I think if, if our eyes are on the government, uh, we, we don't have our eyes in the right place at all. But uh, they had one picture in mind of who Jesus was and what he was supposed to be. And because he didn't show up that way, they could not recognize him at first. All I want to say to you today is this. Wherever you're at in your relationship with God, uh, whether you have never opened your heart to Jesus, whether you have uh, slipped away in your relationship with the Lord, or maybe you just don't even know actually where you stand, the Bible says that heaven is very near you. It's nearer than you think. You may not be recognizing it right now, just like these guys didn't, but heaven is very near you. A rebound from heaven is very near you. Deuteronomy 30, uh, uh, this little passage I love, it says, this commandment which I command you today, it's not too difficult for you. Walking with God is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It's not in heaven that you should say, who go up to heaven for us to get it for us, make us hear it that we may observe it, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who's going to cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near. If I say very near, the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. God is nearer to you than you realize. The Bible teaches us if we will draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. You, in other words, just. You make a move towards God, and God comes running towards you. If you will reach for him, he'll reach for you. I remember, I remember one time we were having a prayer meeting, and I just had this picture of praying and lifting my hands, and that the membrane, if you will, that separated heaven and earth, sometimes it can feel like God is far away or heaven is far away, but it was literally right within reach, and as I was reaching up for God, reaching up to pray, reaching up to worship, heaven was pouring through those holes into my life. So back on the Emmaus Road, uh, Jesus said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they came to a stop, looking sad, one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem? I mean, you know, when your head is set on something, you think everybody's head is set on that, right? Are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happened here in these days? And I love this. Jesus says to them, What sort of things? Like he didn't know. 
what was going on. He was the main figure in the sort of things. He had, he had given his life on the cross. He had gone to hell. He had robbed everything enemy, the enemy had. He's resurrected again, and he's asking them a question. What sort of things uh, are you talking about? They said to him, those about Jesus, the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people. Second thing I want to say today about the great rebound is great rebounders ask the right questions. You, you, you get the right answers when you ask the right questions. And when Jesus is asking them what sort of things, God doesn't need to know the answer. He knows. He's helping us locate who we are when he's asking us a question. So Jesus says, what sort of things? And they're, you know, they're talking about the things that are going on in their life. You remember the story in, in the beginning of the Bible when Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God, and God said, don't eat of this particular fruit. They disobeyed, they ate that fruit. The Bible says God would walk in the garden with them every day. God shows up after they eat that fruit, and he goes, Adam, where are you? He's not asking because he doesn't know. He's God. He's asking because he's now trying, help, trying to help Adam locate himself, not just physically, but literally in his heart. Adam, where are you at on this now? What's just happened? I need you to be aware of what's taking place. I remember one of my favorite stories is in John chapter 5, the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, and he'd been laying there for decades, literally. And the story goes, when the angel would come down and trouble the waters, the first one to get into the water would be healed. And this guy just couldn't get in first. People are always getting in ahead of him. And Jesus comes to him, and Jesus asks him a question, do you want to be healed? Because sometimes people don't want to be healed. They like the attention they get from what's going on in their world. Jesus could have asked them, would you like to have a new mat? Jesus could have asked him, would you like DoorDash to deliver better food to your mat? But Jesus is helping this guy by asking him a question, what do you really want me to do for you? There's a story about a guy named Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is walking along the road and there's a bunch of people around him. There's a guy hanging out on the side of the road. His name is Bartimaeus. He's blind. He's crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And he's feeling around and just he's a blind man. And Jesus asked him, what do you want? It's obvious that he should want to be healed. But there's no telling what's going on, what sort of things are going on in his head. And what I want to say is I think there are things that we're asking God to do. We're asking questions about God doesn't just want to improve an area of your life. God wants to give you a brand new life. And, and maybe we're asking the wrong questions and need to learn how to ask the right ones. So back to the Emmaus Road, verse 20, how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. And this little phrase, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, that he was going to be a political leader. And so, indeed, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. It's like three days have passed since Jesus dies on the cross. We don't know what's going on. We are disappointed. We are confused. We don't know what's happening. And let me put it to you this way. Great rebounders don't give up hope. Now, for some of us, here is our Emmaus Road. 
you had a hope, you had a dream, and it's not happening yet, and you know you just have to keep on walking. Just like these guys were making the walk, trying to sort it all out. So you know, I still gotta get up and go to work. I still gotta pay the bills. I still gotta wash the clothes. Yeah, you don't have to fold them, but at least wash them every once in a while, it'd be good, right? I still gotta fix stuff at the house, right? If you, if you have a house, you gotta fix stuff at the house. That's the way it goes. I still gotta get the oil changed in my car. I'm just saying, you're in church, maybe this is a word from the Lord for you. Come on, man, it's time to change that oil in that car. It's gotten pretty gunky. But you're, you're, you had hopes, you had dreams, they're, they're, they're not happening the way you thought they might have happened. You still got to keep going to class. You still got to keep walking. The problem with life is it's so freaking daily. It, it just, you just, you just got to do, you got to do this every day. Amen. Second service, I love you guys. On, on the Emmaus Road, you're facing a disappointment that it seems to be beyond your ability to fix, you know? So your job isn't really what you hope for. You aren't really accomplishing what you hope for. Uh, how much you would make, you're not really there at the moment. And it's just kind of on an Emmaus Road. Maybe a relationship that you hoped would work out is not working out. Maybe your family is kind of wonky and you're trying to figure it out. And I, I just, what I want to encourage you today, and, and, and I, I speak this with an awareness that when hope dies in your heart, uh, that's not a good thing. You got to keep hope alive. You, you got you to, gotta, they were hoping for something. You know, you remember Moses, he gets this call from God, but then he has 40 years on the backside of the desert. It would have been easy. 40 years is a long time to wait for, for your dream to materialize. You remember Joseph, he has this dream that he's gonna be a leader and he's, he's, you know, God's gonna use him and he ends up in prison for several years for a false accusation. It would have been easy. The Bible says that the word of the Lord tried his heart. He had to keep hope alive in his heart. Remember David? David is anointed to be the new king of Israel, but here is King Saul who is jealous, chasing him around, trying to kill him. He's hiding in caves. He's having to act insane at times so that he doesn't get killed. And I'm just saying a lot of us have found ourselves at times, maybe some of us even today, you're wondering how is this ever gonna happen for me? And I'm just here to say to you, the resurrection should help us know that we can have hope for anything. Right? Hope is the expectation that God has a great future ahead for you. Romans 15, 13 says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our God is a God who gives hope. Our God is a God who wants us to abound in hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not, not to get you on welfare, <laughs> plans for your welfare, and not for calamity, plans to give you a future and a hope. No matter what, please don't ever doubt that God has good plans for your future. Plans for your welfare, plans for your prosperity, plans for you to give you a future and a hope, no plans for calamity. That's the word of God. I would venture to submit to you guys that the, the future he has planned for you may be greater than the future you have planned for yourself. Mm. 
All right, back to the Emmaus Road, verse 22, Luke 24. Also, some women among us left us bewildered. Come on, bro. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the Bible's true. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And so some of those who were with us went to the tomb. We found it exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, you foolish men and slow of heart to believe and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to come into his glory? And look at this. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Come on, would that be great to have a little Bible study with Jesus? He's just explaining it all to you. But I want to say, great rebounders see with a different set of eyes. Because even though Jesus is explaining to them all of this scripture that points to him, they still have yet to have their eyes open. Because I think it's possible for people, like when I try to tell people about Jesus and try to explain Jesus, and I'm thinking, why would you not want a relationship with a God who's for you, who loves you, who wants to bless you, who wants to look over you. Why could you possibly not want that? But it, it, it depends on the kind of eyes you're looking through, right? Because you can look at the, you know, I look at, like, I look at the order of the seasons, uh, which is kind of wonky in North Carolina because Spring, not spring, spring, not spring, oh, spring. Uh, it's finally here. But like in a, in, uh, in a week from tomorrow, there's this uh, solar eclipse that literally is so thinly defined where it's going to happen. How can somebody think that kind of stuff just happens by accident, right? You know, you look at the complexity of the human body. Your eyeball, if you have an iPhone 15, it has a 48 megapixel camera. Your eyeball has a 576 megapixel camera. So I'm saying, who would think that the phone, in an, I mean, that the camera in an iPhone got developed by some kind of chance accident? You put pieces in a bag and shook it up and look at this camera that just came out. But your eyes are 10 to 20, you know, times greater than that, that camera. When you, when you see the changed lives of people who've really surrendered their life to Jesus, it's gotta, it's gotta do something. If we were a few miles closer to the sun, our planet would burn up. If we were a few miles further away, we'd freeze to death. I've always loved this picture of this sand castle. This is a sand castle. It, now, nobody would ever go, you know how that happened? Just time and chance, waves blew up, wind, and this happened. This just took place. No, we all look at that and we go, somebody with talent, somebody with intelligence, somebody with skills, Somebody made that. And all I'm, what I'm saying to you is you can look at all of those things, but if your spiritual eyes aren't really opened yet, none of that stuff is going to convince you to surrender your life to Jesus. It, and I want, your, I, I want your eyes to open because I want, I want you to see the goodness of God. I want you to see how much God loves you. I know that sounds cliche, but it is incredible that the God who owns everything, who runs everything, who made everything, 
that God loves you. He's always for you. It takes the eyes of your heart to see that God has a plan for your life, that God has a purpose for your life. It takes the eyes of your heart to really understand what Jesus did at the cross. Here, Johnny Lynn's up here singing beautifully about thank God for the blood, and some people are going, the blood? What is that, what is that all about? But when you really realize, when you have eyes to see, even the celebration of the resurrection, our, our world is trying to celebrate all kinds of crazy things right now, but when you really see what the resurrection has done for you, you're gonna see life in a different way. Back to the Emmaus Road, they approached the village, verse 28, where they were going, and he, Jesus, gave the impression that he was gonna go farther. They strongly urged him, saying, stay with us. It's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, began giving it to them, and then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus. But look at this, and he vanished from their sight. Great rebounders learn how to walk by faith. So, their eyes are opened, they see who he really is, they get their aha moment, and then vanishes. Look, I think it works that way. You, you see Jesus, you see the vision, you see the plan, you see from the mountaintop what God wants you to do with your life, but then all of a sudden you're down in the valley having to work it out, and you can either work it out by responding to the circumstances in the valley or remembering by faith what God showed you on the mountaintop. <laughs> faith carries the vision you saw on the mountaintop down into the valley. You know, it's, uh, you had the building in the valley, the vision that you saw on the mountaintop. Rebounders learn circumstances don't tell me what to do. I remember what Jesus showed me. I remember what God said to me. I remember the vision, and that's what I'm building my life out of. Back to the Emmaus Road, Luke 24, 32, they said to one another, were our hearts not burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road? while he was explaining the scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the 11, gathered together, and those who were with them and saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he is recognized by them at the breaking of the bread. The last idea that I wanna to give today and then I wanna pray with you guys is this great rebounders have hearts set on fire. Now, everybody knows what it's like to feel your heart on fire, and everybody knows what it's like for your heart to grow cold, for, for, for your heart to, to not feel it anymore. Jesus' death is a victory. He, he paid the price we owed. His resurrection is a rebound. He is raised by God. And what, what I am appealing to your heart today is to say, maybe disappointment has come to your life. Maybe discouragement. Maybe things haven't worked out the way you quite expected. But don't let your heart grow cold. You, 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 you got to stay in that place where your heart is still on fire. You know, God, God put a rebound plan in place immediately. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, he gave this 
prophetic word about how the, the, the Son of God was going to step on the serpent's head with his heel, and even though the, the, the serpent would bite him, he would overcome him. God, in the minute we mess up, the minute something comes against us, can I just tell you that God has a rebound plan in his heart, in his mind, for you. Moses has this call to be this deliverer of Egypt, gets ahead of the timing, messes up, and yet God had a rebound plan in mind for him. David is the king of Israel. He's supposed to be going out to war, and what kings do in the spring, he stays at home, looks down, sees Bathsheba, beautiful woman, bathing, calls for her, he's the king. She comes to him, he gets her pregnant, He's trying to now get her husband to come back from the battle so that it would look like her husband got her pregnant. He said, no way, I'm not doing that. All my buds, all my, all my guys that I'm fighting with are out on the fields, I'm not gonna do that. So David literally plans to get Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, killed. David messed up royalty, but God put a rebound plan in for his life. Peter, if you remember Peter, he was like just this fervent follower of Jesus, but Jesus, all of a sudden things are getting tough and, all, and he denies Jesus three times. Peter messes up, but God still had a rebound plan for him. Rebound lives are full of passion for life. They understand the power of a second chance. Come on. You're never gonna accomplish anything great with your life with your heart cold. It takes, it takes a heart on fire to do anything that's worthwhile. And maybe you're here and you say, my heart is cold right now. Can I just tell you that God wants to set your heart on fire again so that it's not his plan for us to just go through the motions over and over and over again. Resurrection power is here in reality for you if you will open your heart to it. I would love to pray with you today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I'm praying for it every person in this room, that you would help us, that you would give us the rebound, that you would move into our lives and help us to see Jesus clearly. While your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, maybe you're, you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus before. You might've just come to church today, somebody invited you, you saw a sign, you heard about us or something, but you've never surrendered to Jesus. I would love to pray with you. And I don't want you to go through your whole life without knowing the God who loves you, knowing the God who cares for you, the God who wants to help you. Maybe you're here today and you could look back on a day when you used to be closer to God than you are today. And I don't know if it's somebody hurt you or you made bad choices, but you know you're not where you need to be. And I just wanna pray with you today that you would return to the Lord Jesus. Or maybe you just don't feel confident about where you stand with God. So nobody's looking around, just a minute or two left in this meeting, but I just wanna pray with you. If you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I wanna receive Jesus for the first time, or I wanna come back, or I wanna know for sure I'm right with Jesus. Would you just lift your hand up real high and say, that's me, would you pray for me? God bless you. Come on, anybody else? in the room, they just, yes, God bless you, yes. Anybody else? I'm not just, I'm not saying get your act together, I'm just saying open your heart. L let, let God love you, let God be the Lord of your life. Anybody else? Thank you, amen. Hey, let's, let's pray together. This is for everybody who lifted their hand, but I love it if we all would pray this together. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart, I open my life, 
to your love, to your Lordship. I need you. I want you in my life as my Lord. I know I've sinned, but I'm coming to the cross where you paid the price for my forgiveness. Today is a fresh start, a new beginning as I surrender to you. Help me become the person you created me to be. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Amen.